Homage to the fundamental teacher Buddha Shakyamuni, homage to the wisdom warrior Manjushri, homage to all the lineage, benevolent masters, the Dharma, infinitely profound and subtle, is rarely encountered even in a million eons. Now we are able to hear, study, and follow it. May we fully realize the Tathagata's true meaning. In order to liberate all sentient beings from samsara, please generate the Supreme Bodhicitta. Today we are going to learn about the praises to the twenty-one Taras. Praises to the twenty-one Taras is a scripture that can be found in the Buddhist canon. It exists in the Chinese Buddhist canon as well as in the Kanjur. Especially in the Tibetan region and ancient India. There are many teachings and sadhanas of Tara composed by great masters, and in these areas, numerous people believe in and practice Tara. She is just as popular as Manjushri and Avalokiteshvara, but in the Chinese Buddhism, Tara is not so widely practiced. Not too many hold faith in Tara. Nor too many recite prayers or mantras of Tara. In recent years, certain Tibetan masters have been trying to propagate teachings and practices of Tara in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and other places. Except that there is not too much propagation of Tara in mainland. Throughout Chinese history, only a few masters translated some texts of Tara. For example, in Yuan Dynasty, an academician from Hanlin Academy translated praises to the Twenty-One Taras. Hanlin Academy was initiated by Emperor Shenzong of the Tang Dynasty, and later in the Yuan Dynasty, when Chokyo Pakpa was serving as the imperial preceptor, Hanlin Academician An Sar. Was assigned to translate praises to the twenty-one taras. I have read his version of the translation, but feel some parts were translated somehow word by word, while some parts were a little difficult to understand. So this time, by referring to the Tibetan version, as well as looking up for some commentaries in Tibetan Buddhism, I retranslated it. For you who attend this teaching, I think that most may not be too familiar with Tara. You might have heard about the practices of Tara in Tibetan Buddhism, but in fact, it originated from India. As we learn from the biographies of eminent Indian masters, we can see many of them, such as Nagarjuna, Nagabodhi, Shantideva, Lord Atisha, and etc. Often received prophecies from Tara, as well as getting blessing and instructions from her. You may have heard a lot of stories from history, but have not engaged too much in the practices of Tara yourselves. There are Chinese versions of simple practices, sadhanas, and mantras of Tara, but very few in number. Other than these, there seem to be nothing more. So I hope that from now on, through learning this text together, you can try to propagate the practice of Tara extensively in mainland China. For every one of you, in the course of your practice, you will certainly encounter difficulties, adversities, obstacles, troubles, etc. By the blessing of Tara's wisdom, compassion, and power, which is very swift, fierce, and sharp, all obstacles can be dispelled. Meanwhile, wisdom, merits, talents, and benefits of other aspects can be acquired naturally. That's why Tara is also called the embodiment of the activity of all Buddhas, as we often refer to Manjushri as the embodiment of the wisdom of all Buddhas, and Avalokiteshvara as the incarnation of the compassion of all Buddhas.
So there's the saying of Tara being the embodiment of the activity of all Buddhas. What is the activity of Buddhas to alleviate the suffering of sentient beings and to establish them on the fruition of happiness? In this regard, Tara has an exceptional blessing and power. Whoever believes in Tara prays to her respectfully and recites her prayer and mantra frequently, will certainly receive blessing from her and transforms his or her mind stream. Personally, I have a strong faith in Tara since childhood. Perhaps you might think that I'm boasting with whichever topic I'm teaching. That isn't true. Whichever teaching I give, it's always my favorite, or at least one that I have studied, recited, and practiced. This way, the teaching will benefit you more or less. Otherwise, if I'm skeptical with this practice or feel indifferent about it, then I wouldn't be able to teach it to others. Even if I could say something, it would be like an empty vessel with no content to fill up other vessels. You will gain no benefits. So first I have to observe myself. Only if I truly like this teaching very much, that I would be more than happy to share with others and study it together. This is my habit. Compared to the king of aspiration prayer, I am more expert on Tara. I'm not referring to the expertise or the knowledge on giving teachings. I'm saying it from the aspect of devotion, that I have a stronger faith in Tara. When I think back, if I remember it correctly, I can memorize praises to the 21 Taras at around the age of six and a half. I didn't even know how to read, but I can memorize the whole prayer. And ever since that, whenever I'm caught up with obstacles or suffering, the first thought in mind is, Tara will bless me. She will definitely help me. This conviction arises naturally. When I was around 10 or 11 years old, Back then, there was a practitioner named Bema Denzen, who was a Dharma teacher of the Nyingma Dzogchen lineage. Although he later returned his monastic vows, yet his faith in the Three Jewels and his insight into Buddha Dharma were exceptional. He gave me a tiny statue of Tara, which I had kept throughout the time of elementary, junior high, high school, university, and even monkhood. After becoming a monastic, around the time that I returned from the trip of accompanying His Holiness Jimmy Ponsor and Poche to India in 1991, I still had it. I had kept it for so many years, but later this small statue of Tara to say it nicely, flew away, <laughs> or, to be frank, was lost. I feel so sad that it was gone. Although the making wasn't that exquisite compared to the sculptures made nowadays, around that time in the 70s, when I was still in school, the state policy on religion was still tightened, much different from now. At that time, sometimes even teachers and classmates couldn't be trusted. Even in such time, I took the Tara statue with me, wrapping her in a piece of yellow cloth, and prayed to her all the time when I was in school. I could truly feel the great blessing. Now the timing for giving the teaching on Tara is ready. Actually, the idea came up years ago that I would like to give teachings of Tara, but there hadn't been an opportunity with proper causes and conditions to actualize the idea. This year, I feel the opportunity has come. For those who aren't religious or who don't believe in dependent arising, this might seem like a coincidence. But to me, from the beginning of this year, many auspicious signs relevant to Tara arise one after another.
First, I received many books about Tara sending from masters abroad, as well as overseas Buddhists. Then, about two or three months ago, I met Kempo Depa in mainland, who gave me a Tara statue, and I was really happy to receive it. After I came back to Larangar, a while ago, a businessman in India would like to offer me a Manjushri statue, but somehow he couldn't find one. And amongst all his products, that he had with him, he eventually found a very nice Tara sculpture that he had requested from Nepal and gave it to me. A couple days ago, a survey team came to our academy from Shichu County. As many of you may know, there was a very famous Tara statue in Shichu County. Around 2002, when I went to Shichu, I specifically arranged to visit this Tara statue. The statue now is a registered national cultural relic. It has been targeted by some thieves, so the Tara is preserved in the safe and won't be shown publicly. That Tara now is living in the safe. In order to see this statue, one has to know the right people to pull some strings. It takes three doorkeepers to open up the doors. When we went to Shichu, we were fortunate to see the sculpture. After seeing this Tara, I generated a strong faith towards her. Because she is said to be brought by the Chinese princess Wen Chen upon her marriage to King Song Zangenbo. This fine statue was given to people there as a gift. There were three statues brought along by Princess Wen Chen with different stories behind. A while ago, the survey team brought a few precious pictures of the tower with them, put in frames. When they arrived at Larungar, there was only one last picture in hand. They gifted me the last one when we met, and I was very happy. There were so many other signs of auspiciousness, like the green tara and the white tara tanka hanging in our assembly hall here. A while ago, some ladies said they would like to offer a tanka to our assembly hall. Whether intentional or not, the tanka they brought turned out to be a white tara and a green tara, arrived just two days ago. On that exact day, I announced to give this teaching. Later, I told them that I'm just planning to teach the Tara prayer. I believe in dependent arising and feel that these signs are auspicious. Perhaps some materialist people or those with lots of discursive thoughts who are only convinced by deductive logic might not believe in it. They think that, well, such coincidences happen all the time. There is no necessary link among them. You are thinking too much. That's okay. No matter what, starting from this year, in the course of practice, I hope that you will pray to Tara. Indeed, praying to Tara brings significant benefits in all aspects of your practice. In Tibetan Buddhism, as many of you know, in whichever monastery, whether one of Geluk, Sakya, Mingma, or else, Tara is a common practice of the Sangha in their daily recitation or prayers dedicated to patrons. Almost in all occasions of chanting, they will recite prayers of Tara. In particular, they recite praises to 21 Taras very quickly, especially in the Gaelic tradition that we might not be able to catch up with the speed. A couple of days ago, we chanted the prayer together for three times, but many of you simply moved your lips and were unable to keep up with the pace. Let's try to finish one cycle within two or three minutes tops later. It's okay to start a bit slower in the beginning. Surely, it will be a great start to pray to Tara together from now on. Many people will develop great faith in Tara. With faith, Tara's blessing will certainly enter into our mind. Then our activities and every other aspect of life will be successful. So this time, with the chorus of Tara, at the end of every lecture, let's chant praises to the 21 Taras all together and then the dedication prayer. Please be prepared for this. Now, let's begin with the study on the praises to the 21 Taras. It has three parts. 
A1, the beginning, A2, the middle, and A3, the ending. The first part includes B1, the title, and B2, the general homage. Firstly, the title is Praises to the 21 Taras. Praises to the 21 Taras talks about 21 Taras with a stanza of praise for each Tara. This praise actually comes from the Buddhist canon and had been translated into Mandarin Chinese. Master Amoga Vajra had translated a sutra concerning rituals of Tara. In Chinese Buddhism, Tara is called Bodhisattva Dolo, and there there are scriptures on Bodhisattva Dolo. In Tibetan Buddhism, great masters like Atisha classified praises to the 21 Taras in the Kriya Tantra. There are three outer classes of Tantra, Kriya, Charya, and Yoga Tantra. This praise is categorized under Kriya Tantra. Great masters like Atisha reckon that there are 35 collections in the Kriya Tantra, and the third collection is praises to the 21 Taras. Meanwhile, some other masters, such as Master Surya Gupta, consider the praise to be under the Anutara. Yoga Tantra. This praise is believed to be the 570th collection in the Anuttara Yoga Tantra. There are also a few masters who regard the praise as not only included in the Tantric section of the Kriya Tantra, but also in the Anuttara Yoga Tantra. There is no contradictory. For example, the chanting the names of Manjushri can be interpreted from the view of Anuttara Yoga Tantra and can also be interpreted from the view of outer classes of Tantra. Therefore, the ultimate meaning of this praise can be interpreted from the perspective of Anuttara Yoga, yet, in order to apply to beings with different inclinations, it can also be interpreted from the view of outer classes of Tantra. Thus, we can regard this praise as a tantric text. In Chinese Buddhism, especially during the active period of the Chinese esoteric Buddhism, there were also many practices regarding Tara. Unfortunately, it wasn't widespread in mainland China. In this praises to the 21 Taras, each stanza offers praise to each Tara, respectively. If we recite this praise often, we will receive 21 Tara's blessing naturally. In fact, whether it's the green Tara or the white Tara, they are the same by nature. Is Tara a Bodhisattva or a female Buddha? Ultimately speaking, she has already attained Buddhahood. The Guya Garba Tantra mentions the five Buddhas and the five mothers of the five families. Among the five female Buddhas, the consort of Amogasiri, who resides in the north, is Samayatara, also known as Green Tara. So, Tara is a female Buddha. But being in front of certain individuals, she manifests in the form of a Bodhisattva to tame them, which is completely viable. We should know that Tara has attained Buddhahood. Such a Buddha manifests as a female figure to liberate sentient beings. She appears as 21 different forms in front of different beings. The 21 Taras can dispel all kinds of misfortunes and sufferings of beings. So for anyone, Whenever you encounter any disasters, fear, or obstacles in life, in times like these, pray to Tara sincerely is very important. As many old students here may recall that His Holiness Jimmy Pongtsuk was very concerned about the welfare of Larong and sentient beings on this planet. In order to dispel certain disasters and sufferings, he would often ask all the Sangha at Larong 
even practitioners outside the academy, to pray wholeheartedly to Tara. In Chinese Buddhism, people often refer to Avalokiteshvara as the one who liberates beings from suffering and disasters. This title also applies to Tara. The true meaning of Tara is Savior. To save all sentient beings from suffering, who is the savior? Arya Tara, it is, and who are to be saved? The suffering beings. How are they saved? As long as they pray to Tara devotedly, or whoever holds faith prays and implores to Tara on behalf of them. Then, from Tara's wisdom mind, blessing will stream naturally and be bestowed upon these beings. With such blessing, they can go through the challenges. In this age of degeneration, without the blessing of Edoms, Dakinis, and Dharma protectors, one will be feeble in achieving things solely relying on one's own strength, which is like a candle in the wind that cannot put up easily. <coughs> If we get support from these noble ones, even in the age of the five degenerations, when wrong views become prevalent, demonic influences turn rampant. Obstructing forces seem to pervade our life. There are still ways to fight back. Just like the downpour from the sky that can put out a raging fire, through the blessing of their wisdom and compassion, all sufferings and adversities in the world can be crumbled at once. So, I would advise that all Dharma friends should first engender faith in Tara. Once such faith arises, everything can work out smoothly. This also applies to our Dharma study and practice. To be honest, learning, contemplating, and practicing of Dharma is not an easy task. For people who lack faith, then coming to Warung to study and contemplate on Dharma all day can be quite punishing or suffering. But as long as we have faith, we will feel this learning to be an enjoyment, a meaningful activity in life. That's why faith is particularly essential, regarding of which Dharma you would like to practice or whatever else you would like to do, First, you have to generate faith. Without faith, it's fairly challenging to carry out the work, say, to listen to even one lecture. For some people, not to mention to keep up with a long-term study, they cannot even sustain one lecture. I have met someone who told me that I heard how auspicious it is to attend Dharma teaching, so I went for one class. Oh my, it was so hard to sit through the whole time. Time passed by so slowly. It was so unbearable and painful. My knees were numb. Well, actually, to sit in the lotus position won't make your knees numb. But to him, it was extremely painful. The point is that toward any practices, we have to see first whether we can generate confidence within. If we can generate faith and a joyful mind, then whatever we do, not to mention listening to the Dharma, even to enter the hell with burning fire to liberate sentient beings, it will be as the case of Bodhisattvas described in the ornament of the Mahayana Sutras. That they will regard it with total ease, like entering a garden or a swan swimming in the water. So, towards practices of Tara, we should first generate a joyful mindset and faith. Then the blessing of Tara will enter our mind directly. We have just learned about B1, the title. Now, let's look at B2, the general homage. Om, homage to the noble lady Tara. Om is an invocation and a mantra that integrates one's body, speech, and mind with the three vajras of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Homage to the noble lady Tara is the general homage. Noble 
contains the meaning of having wisdom and compassion, as well as possessing vows. Tara or Droma means saving or benefiting sentient beings. In front of this noble lady Tara, with the above mentioned qualities, we, the devoted followers, pay homage reverently and respectfully. Talking about paying homage to Tara, in the tradition of ancient India, even those non Buddhists, many of them practice and pay homage to Tara. Look up in history, for example, in the Nalanda Monastery of India, we can find out that among the wall paintings and among all the sculptures of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas at that time, the images or statues of Tara take up a big percentage. In Bodhgaya, there are a also many Tara statues. In Tibet, almost every monastery has Tara images, statues, and many Tara tankas. In Tibetan's daily life, there is almost no one who doesn't know how to chant the prayers or mantras of Tara. Probably the younger Tibetan generations may not know how to pray to Tara. They may be more interested in making money or some pop cultures. Compared to them, the old generation do have faith in Tara and often chant prayers of Tara. Whoever has faith gains her blessing. Just like the silver moon reflects naturally as long as the pond water is clear. For Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they won't be partial to any particular beings. That would never be the case. They have impartial compassion towards all sentient beings. Therefore, whoever holds the faith naturally receives the blessing of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and gains accomplishments. Whichever practice we engage in, firstly, we must understand the extraordinary qualities of the yiram of the practice. By knowing that, we will generate pure faith. Then with a pure mind, filled with piety and respect, we should pay homage, prostrate, and make offerings to the Yiran. That is, to practice by attending to the Yiran through the seven branches practice. Only in such way can we receive the blessing. Next, let's move on to A2, the middle. Extensive explanation, which has three parts. B1, praise by way of her story. B2, praise by way of the body aspects. B3, praise by the way of the enlightened activities. First of all, A1, praise by way of her story. The verse of praise goes, Homage to Tara, swift in glint, whose glance flashes like flares and lightning. Born from the opening statement of the lotus face of the Triple World's Lord, this is the first Tara named Nirma Pamo, Tara who is swift and courageous. How is she like? Her body is yellow, right? Or red? She is depicted as either yellow or red. This image here is red. Generally speaking, her right hand is in the gesture of bestowing protection. Meaning to protect sentient beings, there is an Utala flower in her left with a white coiling conch shell on it. What is the meaning of Nirma Pamo? Nirma means very swift, and Pamo means heroine or courageous. So it means she is courageous in liberating sentient beings 
and best tells blessing swiftly. Ju Mingpang Rinpoche mentioned in A Garland of Jewels, eight great bodhisattvas, that among all the Irams, Tara's blessing comes the sweetest. At La Rong, in the time of His Holiness Jimmy Pongsuk Rinpoche, whenever obstacles struck La Rongar, His Holiness would ask every one of us to recite prayers of Tara or also Chema, Maruti. Also Chema is also one of the 21 Taras. I think it's the last one listed here. Back to Nirma Pamo, her blessing is incredibly quick. Then what are her qualities? Her eyes of wisdom see and perceive all phenomena instantly. As swift as lightning, as quick as a flash. Lightning happens very fast, appears in a split second. Likewise, for all that is knowable, from material phenomena to the existence of sentient being, from secular things to supramundane matters, in a split moment, Tara sees the ultimate reality of them all. This is about her qualities. Then, what's the origin of Tara? Is there any story behind? Here, the praise says, Triple World's Lord, which refers to the Lord of the Three Realms of Desire, Form, and Formless. Bodhisattva Avalutsvara, who is of great loving kindness and great compassion. His countenance is analogized as lotus. Then, from the opening statement of the lotus like face of Avalutsvara, appears Tara. What does that mean? From historical account, from Avalutsvara's eyes, which are like the center of his lotus like face. Face, appear two tiers of strong compassion for all sentient beings, and from these two tiers appeared white Tara and green Tara. What exactly is the history of it? It is said that it can be traced to many eons ago. In days of yore, Tara was a princess. At that time, in the universe called Manifold Light, there appeared a Tathagata called drum sound. In that world, there was a princess named Yishidawa, or Moon of Wisdom Knowledge, for millions and millions of years. The princess made grand offerings to the Buddha and his countless attendant Sangha. After the offering, some asked about her wishes and urged her to make auspicious wishes. After some discussion with them, finally she said, by the power of this long time of offering, this is what I'm aspiring for. First, since many Buddhas have manifested in male forms to liberate beings, I aspire to work for the benefit of sentient beings in female forms. There is no male or female attributes in the nature of all phenomena, but by appearance, I will liberate sentient beings in female forms. That was her first time of making aspiration. The second time, she aspired. Every day I will liberate millions of beings. I will protect all suffering beings and subdue all demonic forces. The third time, she aspired to share the responsibility of Avalashvara. She appeared from the tears of Avalashvara and aspired to liberate countless beings. These vows had eventually matured. When we talked about the thousand-armed and thousand-eyed Avalashvara, we have mentioned the story. After Avalashvara liberated boundless beings through all forms of manifestations, he took a look and saw that the number of suffering beings weren't any less. There were still countless of them. At that time, Avalashvara Avalokiteshvara appeared to be extremely saddened. He wept, and the tears turned into lotuses. From the blossoming lotuses, white Tara and green Tara appeared. They vowed in front of Avalokiteshvara, Lord Avalokiteshvara, don't be saddened. We will assist you to liberate balanced beings. And these two Taras transformed into 21 Taras. This verse describes how Tara arose from the lotus that grew in Avalokiteshvara. 
almost Avalos tears of pity. Therefore, praying to Tara and praying to Avalos Ishvara are essentially the same in many aspects. There is another historical account. In the eon called Unobstructed, there was a bhikshu named Glow of Immaculate Light. He made great aspirations. All Buddhas of ten directions bestowed him empowerment, so he became Avalokiteshvara. Then again, he received the empowerment from the Tathagatas of the five families, and Tara appeared from his heart. So essentially, Avalokiteshvara and Tara is oneness. In mainland China, Avalokiteshvara is usually regarded as a female Buddha, but in Tibetan region, Avalokiteshvara is regarded as a male bodhisattva. According to Chinese Buddhism, Avalokiteshvara manifests as a female figure to liberate boundless beings, which corresponds to the image of Tara. You can even say that they are entirely the same in many senses. It's just that meaning is not revealed in front of certain individuals. So when we pray, we should realize that they are the same in nature. That's about the first Tara, Nirman Pamo, or Tara who is swift and courageous. The verse praises her with the story of her origin. Now, let's move on to B1, praise by way of the body aspect, which has two parts. C1, praise by way of the Sambhogakaya aspects, and C2, praise by the way of the Dharmakaya aspect. Firstly, C1, praise by way of the Sambhogakaya aspects, which also has two parts. D1, praise by way of the peaceful body aspects, and D2, praise by way of the wrathful body aspects. D1, praise by way of the peaceful body aspects, includes six praises. Among the six, the first is E1, praised by way of the luminous countenance and radiance. That is, to praise from the aspect of Tara's countenance and her brilliant radiance. This outline explains the 21 praises as different aspects of one Tara. We can also regard them as praises for the 21 Taras, respectively. For example, we can just title the first verse as Praise for Tara Nurma Palmo, so on and so. That may be easier for you to memorize, but to have a more systematic analysis on the praise. I'm using this outline. Not sure how it works for your understanding. Let's see. When we were studying the King of Inspiration Prayer, I taught with an outline in a similar way which is like crossing the river by feeling the stones. That's how I'm giving this teaching now. E1, praise by way of the luminous countenance and radiance. Homage to you whose countenance is a hundred full moons gathered in autumn, smiling and glowing with brilliant radiance, like a thousand stars clustered ablaze. This is what Tara, the one that we often mention, as Buddhist, we should get to know these noble deities, otherwise it would be quite unreasonable for us to be ignorant of the various Buddhist deities. Some of you are sketching. That's pretty good. I see many artists here. The text says, Homage to you whose countenance is a hundred full moons, describes Tara, white as the autumn moon who is also called the Seven-Eyed Tara. In some historical records, White Tara has seven eyes of knowledge, three on her face, two on her palms, and two on the soles of feet. The eye on forehead looks up to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, with the six eyes looking out for the condition of beings in the six realms. What about the complexion of the white Tara? It is like a hundred full moons in autumn, stacked up layer upon layer. This is how her countenance looks like. The full autumn moon is unmarred by all dust, clouds, mist, and stains. 
Having a hundred such autumn moons together is to describe that her countenance is of utmost perfection. It doesn't mean her face is big. No, no. It means utmost perfection. This is just an imagery. How is her brilliant radiance? It is as if thousands of stars gathering at once, which is even more brilliant. The moonlight and the brightest starlight. In front of sentient beings, she radiates white beams that stream the moonlight like nectar to dispel beings' burning suffering. We know that many beings now are experiencing lots of fear, worries, sadness, disappointments. And feelings of injustice. There are many beings who are suffering mentally. People nowadays seem to be in good shape, enjoying fine clothing and food. But most of their suffering isn't about the lack of materials. It's the inadequacy of courage and inner strength. That's why there is a growing number of suicides. The reason being the incompetence. Completeness within, which makes everything in life be the cause of pain. In times like these, pray to Tara, and through her blessing, all the fear and uneasiness in our mind can be dispelled instantaneously. Typically speaking, the white Tara is also named. Saravasti in Tibetan Buddhism. As a matter of fact, Saravasti and Vaitara are of oneness. In some books, there is Saravasti, the goddess of wisdom, literary and poetry, who is in fact Vaitara. Many sadhanas of Vaitara and Saravasti are very similar. From this aspect, to practice Vaitara can cultivate great wisdom. Because if we practice Swasti Sadhana well, our poetry skills, intelligence, and meritorious wisdom would also improve. These are the uncommon, extraordinary blessing of Swasti. At the same time, Vaitara is one of the three long-life deities in Tibetan Buddhism. Three long-life deities are Amitayu, Vishnija Vijaya, and Vaitara. In many long-life prayers of great masters, a supplication is made to Amitayu, Vaitara, and Vishnija Vijaya for the longevity of those masters. So the white Tara can be understood as a manifestation of Amitayus. Whether for oneself or others, to have a long life or to be happy, pray to this Tara is very important. In the Tibetan history, Princess Wencheng and Princess Rikuti Devi are considered as embodiments of Tara. Princess Rikuti Devi of Nepal is considered the incarnation of White Tara, while Princess Wencheng being the incarnation of Green Tara. According to some historical accounts, King Songzheng Genpo had fulfilled many national projects. He also prophesied exceptional events for the future. After these, he then touched the head of both princesses to bestow them blessings. Later on, Princess Rikuti Devi turned into a white eight-petal lotus, and upon which the seed syllable of Vaitara showed. Meanwhile, Princess Wencheng turned into a green sixteen-petaled lotus, 
on which the seed syllable of Green Tara appeared. Then, looking up to his deity, the eleventh face of Alokteshvara, the king, together with the two lotuses, dissolved into Alokteshvara. Therefore, all three of them are the manifestations of Alokteshvara. One was coming from mainland China, one from Nepal, and another one in the Tibet region. They appear to be different persons from different places. Places, but finally, they all dissolved into Avalokiteshvara. This account is from reliable historical records. Perhaps people with discursive thoughts may have some other accounts of the history, but based on many reliable historical records and documents that I read, at the last moment of their life, both princesses and the king, all three of them turned into light, dissolved into the heart of the eleventh face of Avalokiteshvara, and then vanished in Avalokiteshvara's heart. Anyway, this white tar. Or Surasti is a deity of long life. Whenever we encounter disasters, fear, or imminent death in life, just pray to Tara. Long ago in India, a disciple of Dignaga was living and teaching the Dharma in eastern India. At that time, a monstrously poisonous serpent appeared. The serpent came out of the ocean and devoured many people and animals. The master immediately thought of Tara, a Yiram he read in ancient classics. According to the classic, if one prays to her, disaster and pain can be dispelled right away. He thought to himself, if I don't take any actions, many lives will be taken by the serpent. He then began to to pray with the mantra of Tara, then the serpent seemed to generate compassion, it stopped harming the beings and returned to the ocean. Thus, the local animals and humans were freed from that life-threatening disaster and enjoyed a happy long life. Many people now wish that their families and themselves can enjoy longevity. Not only their families can stay safe and sound, they can also enjoy happiness and wisdom. In many Tara Sadhanas, it always mentions that if you wish for fortune, offspring, etc., pray to Tara and your wishes can be fulfilled. For those with great negative karma, probably even Buddhas and Bodhisattvas cannot solve their urgent problems in time. But for other people, as long as they pray to Tara sincerely, like by reciting the praise, or the mantra of Tara one-pointedly, Tara will assure them the accomplishment they wish. The above was about what Tara. We have mentioned that the peaceful body is praised from six aspects. Then, E2, praised by way of her color and practice of the six paramitas, that is, to praise Tara from the aspect of her physical complexion and her practice of the six paramitas. Here goes the second praise. Homage, golden blue lady, your hand is graced with the lotus. Generosity, diligence, austerities, serenity, patience, meditation, your field. The verse is praising Sonam Chokta, or Tara, golden color. She is one of the 21 Taras. Who is the subject of veneration? Tara, golden colored. She is yellow bodied, and for her hand gestures, her right hand is in the gesture of bestowing protection, with the left hand holding a lotus, having a wish fulfilling jewel on top. Right? There should be one. Can you see it? Poor vision? All right then. Your hand is graced with the lotus, meaning, on top of the lotus, there is a wish fulfilling jewel, which can satisfy the wish of dispelling poverty and gaining fortunes. 
It is the jewel that fulfills all wishes for whoever prays to it. Lotus, with such a jewel, adorns her wondrous hand. This particular Tara liberates beings or fulfills beings' wishes by way of the six paramitas. The first of the six paramitas is generosity. Second is diligence. The third is austerities, serenity. In many commentaries, austerities, serenity is explained as discipline. In other words, to uphold discipline, one must undergo asceticism in a place of serenity. This is the third parameter. Fourth is patience. Fifth, being meditative concentration. The sixth is practicing your field, meaning to enter into the nature of the knowable. That is to enter into the nature of all phenomena, the field of the knowable. In order to truly steer every phenomenon, one must unfold one's wisdom. So, your field refers to the parameter of wisdom. Through the practice of the parameter of wisdom, Tara liberates boundless beings by way of the six parameters, with the former five as the skillful means, while the last being the direct development of the wisdom of prajna. Through these six parameters and balance activities, she benefits sentient beings. This is the main feature of this Tara. By praying to her, wisdom improves, merit increases, life is prolonged. While ignorance and suffering in all aspects can be removed and disasters are dispelled, when praying to Tara, pray devotedly with a cheerful spirit. Then, whatever you need, may it be wealth, merit, and more, all can be fulfilled. Here's a story about how Tara fulfills wishes. Near the Nalanda Monastery in India, there was a beggar whose daughter was getting married. But the household was extremely poor. Having no means to arrange for her marriage, the old woman went around begging. As she was approaching Nalanda, she heard about the famous master Chandrakirti and went to him begging for wealth. She said, My daughter is getting married, but we are too poor. We feel embarrassed in front of the groom's family. Can you please grant us some fortune? Chandrakirti at the time appeared to have few material possessions himself. He said, I'm an ascetic monk myself with a few belongings. There's one named Chandragomin nearby. Go to him. Chandragomin is the one who often challenged Chandrakirti to debates. Maybe Chandrakirti did that on purpose to refer the beggar to Chandragomin. After all, Chandragomin was a layperson. We monks have not much fortune to spare. Go to Chandragomin, seek help from him. So the beggar went to see Chandragomin. When she got there, this beggar must be a very eloquent speaker. You know some beggars are real sweet talkers who can move lots of people. I actually have many stories about this, but I'll keep them to myself. Anyway, she went to beg Chandragomin. After her plea, the master expressed strong compassion for her. But he said, I only have a few sutra of Prajnaparamita, my clothing, and a few necessities. Besides these, I have nothing 
to give you. Although he was a layman, he was content with little possessions, so he had nothing else to give to the beggar. Probably at that time of India, people weren't too well off. We visited two decades ago, and I heard that the situation still hasn't changed much. Anyhow, it seems at that time those famous masters were not wealthy either. Seeing the poor beggar, Chandragomen prayed to a painting of Tara on the wall, the one that he often made prayers to. There were lots of accessories, such as jewelry, gold, and silver on this Tara. He prayed, Please grant the wish of this beggar. What a poor lady she is. As soon as he prayed, the Tara came to life. In the form of a beautiful lady, she took off all the jewelries to this beggar. The beggar was thrilled, accepted these gifts very happily, and left. With the jewelries, she became rich and could finally well marry off her daughter. Then Chandra Gomin found that this Tara painting, since she had taken off all her accessories and gave them to the beggar, she became naked without the ornaments. This is why, in the relevant history, this Tara is named Tara without ornaments. I remember that this story can be found in history of Buddhism in India and achievements of the Himalayan masters. It is said that this painting of Tara without ornaments has been preserved for a long time in history. Whether it's in India or Tibetan region, there have been many miraculous stories about Tara, such as how Tara statues spoke to or instructed people. There are plenty stories of Tara's miracles, just like the case of Avalokiteshvara in mainland China. So when we pray, just as Chandra Gomin said, as long as you pray selflessly, there is no wish that Tara would not fulfill. When we pray, it's best that we pray selflessly, not for our self-interest, but only for the welfare of sentient beings. Nonetheless, if you pray for personal interest, you may still receive a corresponding blessing. So, in our daily life or throughout the course of Dharma learning and practice, we should pray to Tara, just like how previous masters did. Then adversities in our life or Dharma practice will be dispelled naturally. Take myself, for example, when I was about to become ordained as a monk, I faced many challenges. Back then, it seemed that I couldn't fight against them. Then I tried my best to pray to Tara. A while ago, my college teacher came to visit. I would have to say that it is probably the blessing of Tara so that I could take the ordination successfully. At the time, this teacher thought highly of me. If I didn't get his approval to drop out of school, my family would be fined 3,000 renminbi. 3,000 renminbi was a huge sum of money at the time, which my family wouldn't be able to afford even for years. So I had to go to my teacher for permission. He approved my request without hesitation. Actually, before entering his house, I secretly recited Tara. So I asked this teacher when he came to visit, you wouldn't have agreed at the time, as you wouldn't like me to become a monk. How did you change your mind? He said, I don't know why I agree with you to quit school. I must have got into a muddle. So personally, I feel that the blessing of Tara is extremely genuine and responsive. Surely, everyone has their own goals of spiritual practice or other wishes. In the process, when facing certain challenges that need to be dealt with immediately, through praying to Tara, then miraculously, these difficulties will be solved swiftly. Starting from now, please try to pray to Tara constantly so that you can remove challenges 
for Dharma practice and have your wishes fulfilled. That's it for today.